there, and welcome back to another episode of Triple D. So we're continuing on with our study in Westminster Chapter 5 of the Confession of Faith, uh, the doctrine of God's providence, of God's sovereignty, of God's usage of means, and uh, His cause of all things. So Steve, today we're going to look at uh, the next section, actually. So we're going to do Chapter 5, Section 2 in Westminster, as well as the accompanying verses that come along with it. So as we continue to discuss God's sovereignty, God's usage of providence. So today we're going to talk about God's sovereign usage of means. God uses means to further accomplish his ends. That could be a virus, that could be uh, an attack, that could be anything. But God is still sovereign, though he uses means. He is the first cause of all things, of course. But he uses secondary means, whether freely, contingently, uh, or uh, necessarily. So God uses means in those manners. So Steve, I'm going to read our text okay. today, and then we'll uh, discuss a few things with our audience in between each other as well. So, Although in relation to the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly, yet by the same providence he ordered them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily freely or contingently. So Steve, what, what I wanted to talk about today is God is the first cause of everything. So God is not, of course, the author of sin. He is he cannot sin, so of course, but he does ordain these things to come to pass. He ordained the fall to come to pass, for instance. Why? We don't know. We're not given that in the scripture, and we cannot speak where scripture does not allow us to go to. But God is the one who ordained these things to happen. He allowed it to happen according to his own purpose and according to his own will. So Steve, God is the first cause of all things. Would you would you explain what the first cause exactly means? What what do you understand that as? Well, the first cause is the primary cause. The second cause might be the, it, what flows out of the first cause. And when something like the virus hits, if, if it came out of a lab in China, if it leaked out of there somehow or whatever, however it got out, that's the second cause. The first cause would be God who ordained that that would happen and the lessons that we would learn from it and what we need to learn. And one thing I've observed throughout my life as far as the majority of Christian people, we spend too much time looking at second causes. I have heart trouble. I have back trouble. I have cancer now. Whatever that may be, we need to stop looking at second causes and realize that the first cause of all things must be attributed to God. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have to remember that God does all things to the power of his own glory, to the praise of his own glory, to the praise of his own name, and to the furtherance of his kingdom. So God uses secondary means, of course, but you're absolutely right, though, Steve, and I would add as well that uh, even from our own personal lives, you know, we have our own trials, we have our own tribulations, but we don't look at the things of, you know, of themselves. We look at God who provides comfort during those times, who is the primary cause of all things, who is the first cause. So, Steve, what exactly, if we, as we look through Westminster as well, what would you say that uh, in this first clause, uh, the first cause, all things come to pass immutably and infallibly? So, exactly define those terms for us. What does, what does Westminster mean when it says that all of these things come across as immutable and infallible? It means it doesn't change, meaning God doesn't change. God can't change his mind. When we pray, we aren't praying to persuade God to change his mind. We're praying to make God's will our will. We're trying to change our mind. So God doesn't change. We can't change his mind. He doesn't make mistakes. He's not going to look back and say, I wish I'd have done it this way or that way. There's a plan that's right from, from the beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree 100%. And so, Steve, in, in as far as application goes, does that mean that God ordains trials? Does when something happens to me, when I get sick, if I were to come down with something, if I were to break my leg walking outside of our church today, would that mean that God ordained that to come to pass? Yes. Absolutely. And our example there is Job, as we've talked about before. Job, when he lost everything, did not say the devil did this to me. Job was such a godly man. He saw God in it, and he knew that the Lord had done that to him for whatever purpose at the time. He didn't know the purpose at the time. We now know the purpose. But that's a great example. I'm glad we, that Job didn't know the purpose because today when something happens in our lives, we don't always know what the reason or the purpose is. The Lord wants to strengthen our faith. And let's admit it, we grow more spiritually 
during hard times than we do good times. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just like the athlete that Paul gives in uh, the example uh, later on in the epistles. So, you know, an athlete trains his body. And an athlete has to be hard on his body, otherwise he's just going to go fat and lazy. The same with trials as a Christian. We have to have these trials and tribulations come upon us because out of them comes the steadfastness of faith. We become stronger through that and we become far more reliant upon the Lord when we, incur, when we encounter trials of various kinds. James makes that clear as well. But it is God who inevitably causes these things. They come across immutably. They do not change, nor does the will of God change. They come across infallibly because God cannot do things wrong. Uh, he cannot do things sinfully because he is God. And in them there is no darkness, as First John makes clear. So absolutely, Steve, I agree 100% that God is the first cause of all things. Westminster makes that clear. The Reformed churches and the scriptures, we would say as well, teach this to come to pass. So, Steve, let's jump into the next section then. So, what about secondary causes? So, uh, what what exactly is a secondary cause that you would say? Let's define that more clearly for our viewers. Out well, when 9-11 hit, the terrorist was the secondary cause. Mm -hmm. We must realize that the first cause was God. Now, God's not the author of evil, mm -hmm. but if God opens the gate and allows something to happen, ordains something to happen, he doesn't, he's not the author of sin. He's just letting sinful people do what they want to do anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Steve, when, uh, when I was coming up with our discussion questions, actually, for today, I thought of the example of Judas Iscariot, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it was God who caused uh, the crucifixion in the, in the grand scheme of things. Then the scriptures make that clear, that it was God who ordained the crucifixion to come to pass. And we're going to look at some scripture texts to prove our point here in just a moment. But Judas Iscariot was responsible for his own sin as well. He was judged. I, if you, I love uh, Dante's Inferno as well. Uh, Dante's Inferno is a, a great book. I'd highly encourage you to read it uh, just for the poetic nature of uh, Dante writing through that. And he shows that Judas Iscariot does receive the worst punishment humanly imaginable uh, in Hades itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty gruesome picture, actually. So Judas is responsible for his own sin just as we are responsible for our own sin. We can't... The, the clay does not say to the maker, why have you made me as such, Romans 9 makes clear. So Judas himself was responsible for his own sin, but it is God who ordained these things to come to pass, of course. God is not responsible for it. He merely uses people's already pre-existing sin, but he is the first cause of all things. So, Steve, let's jump into some scripture text. So I asked you to look up Acts 2.23. So if you would look at that and read that for me as well. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And there's so much here. And some people struggle with this. But this man, being Judas, was delivered over to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, meaning God preordained that Judas would do this. Judas could do nothing but this, but Judas did what Judas wanted to do. If you ask Judas what his free will was, his free will was to turn Jesus in and have him crucified. But God had ordained before the world was created that Judas would do just that. But yet we read here that you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, meaning the people that were there, you were a part of this. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and you're absolutely right, Steve. If Judas would have exercised his free will, that's what his free will would have been. That was his choice as well to do that. So that uh, there is not a, uh, uh, a conflict or anything yeah. between the free will of man and the predetermined will of God. God There's didn't a, make Judas do that. Absolutely. Judas did it because Judas wanted to. Absolutely. Just as Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God, God himself says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Right. But he's merely using the sin that's already present there, the same as he used with Judas. So, Steve, in, in discussion of secondary causes, I also wanted to talk about Jeremiah 31, 35. So, and here... The prophet says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. So here, Steve, the prophet is giving us a picture of nature. The sun rises in the east every day. God is the first cause of that thing, but he has also set those things into motion. So the same as the waves, if you go down to the beach, down near Myrtle Beach or so, you'll see the waves coming in and going out, the tides growing up. You'll have high tide, you'll have low tide. So God is the first cause of that. He's the one who created it. 
But it also works naturally because he has created it to be as such as well. But God is still the first causes, though the ca- second cause of the tide coming in is because of the moon. We also know that from science, right, right Steve? So we also always know that. So, Steve, we see that with Judas Iscariot. We see all of that, and we understand, too, that this is a hard doctrine to understand. This is, is. This is extremely hard for mere mortals to grasp their minds around. So we understand, too, as Reformed Christians, Steve, that it, it is hard to understand this, and we fully don't understand it no. as well. So, And we never will fully understand it as well. So, Steve, you can, uh, as we've said in several other videos, too, Job, the example of Job, God doesn't give a reason for what he did to Job. Correct, Steve? That's right. So what does he say to Job? Exactly. He, he doesn't tell Job why. He just starts giving Job an exam and say, okay, Job, if you've got the answers, where were you when I created the world? And Job says, uh, uh, I wasn't there. So he gives Job a series of questions and exams about creation and the animals and things like that. When God created the universe, he basically says, Job, where were you when I did all these things? And Job has no answers. So at the end, Job just basically bows his head, falls on his knees, submits to the sovereignty of God, and says, you know best. Absolutely. And really, Steve, as a Christian, that's what we must do as well, is we must cast ourselves upon the sovereign mercy of God. Uh, he is He is God. He does what He wills, not what we will. But He will always work out for good, according to those who love God. We talked last week briefly about the example of Joseph. Uh, God used yeah. secondary means to accomplish His task. And His uh, ultimate goal was the salvation of His people. He saved the other brothers. He saved Jacob. He saved the line from which the promised seed of Christ would come, of course. He used secondary means to accomplish it, but God was the first cause of everything in there. Westminster makes that so clear, and it harnesses what's already in the Scriptures and puts it into a systematic fashion. This is all from the Scriptures. This isn't just a Presbyterian view. This is a Christian view, I would say, Steve. So, Steve, if you would, in closing, let's turn over really quickly to Psalm 145. So, we uh, here at Triple D, we love to end with Psalms. Uh, this is the, the hymn book, the prayer book of the Bible. So, Steve, if you would read Psalm 145, verses 17 through 20 as we wrap up today right. with our session. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Amen and amen. So, Steve, the the Lord is near to those who call upon his name, yet he will not allow the guilty to go unpunished. So, Steve, with that, I think that we uh, have reached our close for the day. So we thank you for tuning in. And for all of those out there who are members of our church, we encourage you to come out this Lord's Day as we resume services here at LHP. So we would encourage you to come out to that if you're able. Uh, We thank you for tuning in with us today, and we ask that you would be with us next week as we continue our study of God's providence. See you then.